All right. In this video, I want to talk about the Queen of Heaven. Now, the Catholics refer to Mary as the Queen of Heaven, and their justification for this is not because she's ever called the Queen of Heaven by God, Jesus, or anyone in the scriptures, but because of this right here in Revelation chapter 12, where it says a woman, a woman, just making it clear, it doesn't define who the woman is, appears in heaven. And she has 12 stars as a crown, clothed with the sun and the moon beneath her feet. And she's a virgin. She gives birth to the man-child, Jesus Christ, who is going to rule over all nations with a rod of iron. So they're like, hey, this is Mary, who gave birth to Jesus. Yet, after Jesus is ascends to heaven, the woman flees into the wilderness for three and a half years. It says 2,000 or 8,200 in three score days, or as it says now here, when she flees into the wilderness, it says for a time, times, and half a time. A time is a year, times is two, half a time, half a year. So we get two mentions of her fleeing after Jesus ascends to heaven into the wilderness for three and a half years. Mary never did this. Right? Not to mention what this is going on. Satan and his angels are cast out of heaven. When did that happen? No one can name that happening. Right? Because this is a actual future event. The woman here represents Israel as we read in Joseph's dream in Genesis that he has the stars and the sun and the moon bow to him, representing the 12 tribes of Israel as the stars, as the sun and the moon representing his father and mother. This is Israel that gave birth to Jesus. And then at the rapture of the church, the body of Christ taken up, who Jesus already told, in the messages to the churches that they will rule with a rod of iron with them if they overcome. When they are taken up, when we are taken up, that's when Israel flees into the wilderness for three and a half years. Now that's a study within itself, but I just wanted to make the point clear that this is not Mary. Not to mention that uh, we're looking at future events. Yes, some of this is past, some of this is present from what John's talking about, and then there's future things, as Jesus told him to write things that was, things that are, and things that will be. But just looking at the context of this woman, we see what this woman is and what this woman represents. The nation of Israel, just like we see this seven-headed dragon, that is Satan. In the very next chapter, we see this same thing as a seven-headed beast made up of the beast in Daniel chapter 7, depicting different kingdoms. So we see that the beast that's trying to go after Israel is a nation, and the woman is Israel a nation being attacked by an, another confederacy of nations? Right? It's very easy to put together because the Bible clearly explains these things when you compare the Bible to the Bible and you don't just make a private interpretation of it. So, uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because of something else that is said. Over here, I believe it's Revelation chapter 4. It might be chapter 5. But it talks about the elders. And they had incense. 
Uh, let me just check the next chapter real quick because I'm not seeing it here. And maybe it's not in the these two chapters. Maybe I remember it, remembered it wrong. Uh, right here at verse 8 talks about the elders, which is the church that has just been raptured. Uh, we see that at the beginning of chapter 4, at the end of the church age, that was mentioned in Revelations chapters 2 and 3, that John, representing one body, the church, called up to heaven. Immediately he's in the spirit. And then we have the elders that were redeemed out of every blood, kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and made kings and priests on the God. That's the same thing he said about us in chapter 1 of Revelation, where he said that we are washed in the blood of Jesus and made kings and priests on the God. So here we can see that the rapture has happened, and the saints, the actual church that's raptured, is offering up the prayers of the saints. So it's their own prayers, which is these uh, vials of odors, these incense, right? And the uh, Catholics will tell me that, uh, hey, look, these people are offering a prayer, so they're interceding for us. And a completely misunderstanding of who is doing what here. And they somehow twist this to mean that they, they are praying to angels, they're praying to Mary, they're praying to the dead saints. And they are taking the prayers and bringing them to God. That's a complete twisting of what is going actually going on right here. But the point I wanted to take from this is that the Catholics understand that the incense represents the prayers. We can see the same thing uh, being mentioned in the Old Testament as well. There might be a, another reference or two in the New Testament to it as, as well, but... Uh, what I really wanted to focus on was right here. I have this whole part highlighted just because there's like four or five mentions between verse 17 and 25 of incense being burnt. And it says here at verse 16 of Jeremiah chapter 44, it says, Ask for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord. We will not hearken unto thee. Okay, I actually read verse 16 instead of verse, instead of verse 17. Sorry about that. 17, it says, But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offering unto her as well as we have done. Now, you notice that they're burning incense to the queen of heaven. They're being told not to do this. We see it again, uh, burning incense to the Queen of Heaven. It says it again here. We burned incense to the Queen of Heaven. And it might say it another time, but I know it does again down here, verse 25. So we see here they're burning incense. They're offering up prayers to the Queen of Heaven. And because of this, they're being judged and condemned. So why would God be upset about prayers being offered up to the Queen of Heaven? Because only God can actually hear everybody's prayers, no matter where they are, whether it's in place on the earth or in a place in time from the beginning of the world or the end of the world, or whether it's prayers coming from your heart. And you're not speaking them out loud. Only God can hear everyone's prayers all at once. Right? So, when you're actually praying to someone or something in the spiritual realm, you are giving it the attribute of God. Because you're saying, hey, this being is always watching me and is going to pay attention as soon as I speak to it. And not only that, it can hear me even if hundreds, if not 
thousands and millions of people around the world are praying to this being at the same time. This being is able to hear and answer us all. It's an act of worship to pray. And as it says in Jeremiah chapter 7, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings onto their gods that they may provoke me to anger. So you see, all of this is to piss off God. But at the same time, they claim this is also has to do with traditional uh, Jewish worship, Hebrew worship, Israeli worship. Just like at Mount Sinai, when Moses was up in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, they decided to make golden calves. And they said, these are the gods that brought us out of, the, out of Egypt. Right? They were basically calling the, these golden calves yod heh vav -Hey, right? And they were attributing it to their god when it wasn't. And we see the same thing happening again in history now with Christianity, doing the same thing, except they called the Queen of Heaven Mary to justify doing the same pagan stuff that has been going on for who knows how long, thousands of years. We can see this also, I believe, in Acts, where Paul comes into a city and he's telling them about God, and they get pissed off, and they start chanting, Great is Diana. And start chanting it over and over. And uh, a lot of these people who make idols get pissed off at Paul and the other Christians because they're ruining their business. Where they sculpt these things and they sell them to people and they're selling to them their gods and what have you. And they're telling them how these are just pieces of clay and wood and stone that you just put a smiley face on and you're on it and you're calling it your god and now they they do the same thing and they call it jesus then mary and peter and any other saint they want to call it and it's just a piece of material that you shaped into a form to look like a man or a woman right it's no different than if i took a piece of two by four, stuck it in the ground, put a smiley face on it and said, this is Mary, and then bowed down to it and prayed, you would think that's silly. It, but it's the same thing that you're doing with this. But it just goes to show, I put this up to remind me, to talk a bit about the authority, is that uh, I talk to Catholics a lot about authority. As they like to say that their church gave us the Bible, and therefore they are the infallible interpreter of it, and we have to listen to what they say that it says instead of reading it for ourselves. I don't know why we can't just read it for ourselves. We have to listen to what they say that it says. That's very fishy and very strange. But anyway, uh, by the, this whole mindset, they think, again, they have this, this imagined authority. So I try to reason with them about this. It's like, hey, well, look at history, right? I mean, if we look at governments and colleges, as a quick example, uh, something like America, I brought this point up before, where we have George Washington establishing the United States, and we have Joe Biden now as president, so he's in a successor of George Washington, right? But he has completely different ideology and beliefs and economic system and everything. Uh, pretty much everything is completely different now. So it doesn't matter that they're in succession. That doesn't mean they believe and teach the same things, right? And 
just because the the Bible says to be in submission to governments, it also tells us to submit to God ultimately, that we ought to listen to God rather than men, such as when the Pharaoh told the Hebrew midwives to kill all the children, and they didn't, the Pharaoh got mad, and it said they did that because they feared God. So ultimately, you listen to God over the governments. And if you look at universities and colleges, if you were to submit to the authority of the professors and their supposed authority over science and philosophy and what have you, well, then you'll just end up denying that God even exists. Because that's basically the main thing they're putting out now. Atheism. God, God doesn't even exist. Right? So if you want to follow these authorities, you're going to get led astray. You've got to think for yourself. Now, you've got to just apply this same thing to the church. We can see this in history with Israel, where they had established authority, where at first, God didn't even want them to have kings. But they wanted to be like the Gentiles, so boom, they have a king. And he warned them that the king's just going to lead them astray and do all these things, and that's what Saul did. And then later on, with Solomon and then other kings, just led them deep into apostasy, right? But they had the authority, and if you follow that authority, you would have been led into apostasy. And then you have the religious leadership, the clergy. Where in Jesus' day, if you were to follow the religious leadership and their authority, you would have denied that Jesus is the Messiah because that's what they were saying. They were saying that he is not the Messiah. So if you didn't think for yourself and read the scriptures on your own, then you would have rejected Jesus. Because that's what the religious leadership was doing at the time with their supposed authority. And now today, the Catholic Church, and a lot of these Catholics would agree with me what I said about government, what I said about the universities, and what I said about Israel. But when it comes to them, nope, all of a sudden you become a cult, you throw your brain out the window, and you submit blindly to their authority. You do not question it. You don't read the Bible for yourself and interpret it for yourself so that you can answer to God for yourself, even though the Bible tells you to, to study, to show yourself approved unto God. No, you don't do that. You submit to the church's authority. And then they do things like this, having you offering up prayers to the Queen of Heaven, which provokes God to anger. Nowhere in the scriptures is anyone prayed to except for God, unless, unless it's pagans and heathens doing it. But, uh, I just think that's strange. When you can go directly to God, I don't know why you wouldn't go directly to God. It just doesn't make sense. It's like, God is your father, but instead of going directly to your father, you're going to go to your brother, go to your sister, for them to go to your father as if you can't go to your father. Like that time you could have been talking to your father, instead you took the time to talk to your brother and your sister to do it for you. So you're not having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. You're having them doing it, right? And it's kind of like uh, going to call your father. Let's use it in that, in it that way. So you could just call your father and talk to him. But instead, you take the time and you call up your brother, you call up your sister, and you ask them to call your father for you. And it'd just be like, why don't you just call him? It, I just find it just weird. And now it's a little bit different when you and your brothers and your sisters are going to God at the same time 
with an issue and you're all praying to God about something or praying for somebody who's sick, somebody who's in some kind of financial trouble or something along those lines. That is everybody asking God for the same thing and you're all coming together. But praying to somebody on the other side is just weird. Like the, going back to that phone call, let's say you're in America and your father is in France and so is your brother. Why call your brother to talk to your father when you could just call your father yourself? You see how it's just weird, but uh, for some reason they think they need to do that. It's weird because I'll talk to them and I'll be like, is God a respecter of persons? No. Well, then why are you acting as though God is? As if you can't talk to him yourself, you need to go through all these other people to do so. This doesn't make sense. But, uh, yeah, I could just keep rambling on on that. But, uh, yeah, so this authority, it's its a joke. It, it's not real. Because, like I was saying, how these Catholics will say that the church gave us the, uh, the Bible and they put the Bible together and they've given you the Bible. They give authority to the Bible. And then you ask them, well, where did they get the authority to do that? Well, let me open up the Bible. See, the Bible gives us that authority. That's circular reasoning. You're saying that you give authority to the Bible, and then the Bible gives you that authority. Well, isn't that convenient? Ain't that just a wonderful interpretation you have there? But, uh, yeah. I guess I'll wrap it up by just uh, saying this one Last thing that I was bringing up in one of these forums, I was talking about this fellow who was against Sola Scriptura. So I put together an analogy, and I was saying, let's say we get a math book that tells us 2 plus 2 is 4. But we have 20,000 different groups of people telling us that they go and they use the math book alone, but... They're saying that 2 plus 2 equals anything but 4, right? They're not saying it equals 4. It equals anything but 4. Now, why would you believe that they're going by the math book alone? Just because they say they do? I mean, that's just stupid. The way to find out if they're really going by that math book alone is to open up the math book yourself, and you read, oh, it says 2 plus 2 is 4. Which one of these groups is actually saying that? None of them? Okay, well then they're not going by the book alone. They're going by the book plus their group and their group's interpretation. Now, if you take another group that says you need the math book plus the teachers plus the math traditions, but they are still saying that 2 plus 2 isn't 4, it's still stupid to follow them because you can open up the math book yourself and say, hey, well, it says 2 plus 2 equals 4, but you're saying you have this infallible interpretation and that you're relying on the teachers and the math traditions, and but you're saying that 2 plus 2 is 10 when it's not. And then they try to say that you're just not educated you just don't have the understanding. You just need to shut your brain up and throw it out the window and just listen to them. And it's like, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. That that would be stupid. Uh, that's what cults want you to do. And uh, the right thing to do in that situation is to take the book, read it for yourself, and then... Judge for yourself if any one of these groups is even using the math book at all. And then determine whether you want to use the math book or follow one of those groups. That's ultimately what it comes down to. So if you take the math book, obviously, is the Bible. And 
you're reading it for yourself and these other groups are saying no it doesn't say what it it's actually saying what it actually says is this be like well i don't believe you you know that's that you know I, what what you're saying it says doesn't make any sense and that's how you should do it and if you're reading it and what they're saying matches up with what it says okay but just because they're right about one thing doesn't mean they're right about everything. And just because they're wrong about one thing doesn't mean they're wrong about everything. Right? So, I could just ramble on and on about that. But, uh, yeah, that's that. Thanks for watching. Take care.